This is Angelo. I'm 17 years old and live in Beachview. I'm Janila and I'm 12 years old and I live in Pittsburgh. This is Anna. I'm 17 years old and I live in Murraysville. This is Rocco. I'm 13 years old and live in Southside. And this is the Kidsburg Podcast. So glad you're hanging with us for our brand new Kidsburg podcast. We have got so many cool things to share with you for kids, parents, grandparents, and caregivers. Yeah, we are really excited to bring so many cool resources and ideas and people to all of you guys. So happy to be here. Welcome everyone to our inaugural podcast. Yeah, so this podcast is part of kidsburg.org, which is a website based in Pittsburgh with resources on the places, people, and ideas that are making Pittsburgh one of the most kid-friendly places. I'm Christine Sorensen, and I'm a Kidsburg producer and KDKA anchor, and you can see my Kidsburg stories on TV, radio, and our website. And I'm here with two amazing women, Melissa Rayworth, who is the editor of kidsburg.org. She runs the website with all the amazing stories you're going to read online. Thank you, Christine. One of the best parts of my job is exploring all of the amazing things in our area for kids and families. And Yuling Chang is here. She's the director of Kidsburg and keeps us all organized and the website running. Thanks, Christine. I'm excited for this new podcast. We love trying new things and finding new ways to help parents. Okay, we have to mention, of course, we're all parents as well. I've got three kids, two girls and a boy, ages 9 to 13. Melissa? I have two boys, ages 17 and 20. And I have two girls, ages 10 and 12. Yeah, we all love using the site as well. And so today, we've got so many great things to share with you in each podcast. So each episode, we're going to start with a Pittsburgh gem, a place where we think you are going to want to check out with your family, probably someplace you may never have heard of or been to. And today, it's a place called Dragon's Den. And then you are going to listen in on a conversation with someone who is inspiring us and inspiring young people. These are leaders from around the world, each with some Pittsburgh connection and also folks who are doing cool things right here in Pittsburgh. This episode, we are going to talk with former Pittsburgh Pirate Travis Snyder about athletics and mental health and what parents and kids can do to approach the sports experience with a healthy mindset. And last, teenagers themselves will answer some burning questions we bet you've been wanting to know. For example, today we ask, what can parents do to have a better conversation? All right, so let's get started. I am so excited to share this Pittsburgh gem because it's really one of the most unique places I've ever been to. It's a high ropes and low ropes course, zip line and climbing wall, inside a church. (laughs) This is in a town just outside Pittsburgh called Homestead. It's the most imaginative use of a former church that I've ever seen. And we talked with the woman who created Dragon's Den four years ago, Julia Petrucci. What's really cool about Dragon's Den is it's not just a gym. It's really all about helping kids, especially in the low-income neighborhood where it's located, and using the challenge of the ropes course to build confidence and self-esteem. Julia told us it started with inspiration from a priest on a mission in Patagonia. Spending three weeks with him, we learned that we should be the change that we want to see. Uh, Later on, I received many blessings in my life and uh, I wanted to pay it forward. Years later, Julia was back in Italy, which is her home, with her two kids who did a ropes course for the first time. And when they did, she could not believe their reaction. I went to this place. I thought I was going to die because we were walking in the air. But then I didn't die. And then I did it. And they were so energized that I decided, you know what? I want to come and visit. So when Julia discovered the abandoned church outside Pittsburgh and began thinking about how she could use it to help kids, it struck her. I started thinking, you know, that church, St. Mary Magdalene, has so many columns, and those columns reminded me of the trees, of the ropes course that I had just visited. Julia's husband is an engineer. She's an artist. They both thought the same thing about turning the church into a ropes course. And I actually tried this ropes course when I did a TV story for Kidsburg and KDKA at Dragon's Den. And I have to tell you, I was scared. I mean, it is really high up in the rafters of this church. And I wasn't actually expecting to be so scared, but I did get to experience that. And it really helped me appreciate how this can be such a learning experience for kids. And then there's the zip line. I mean, that is a blast. It goes from the choir loft all the way to the altar. Never did I think I'd fly over church quite (laughs) like that. (laughs) 
But honestly, the coolest part of Dragon's Den is how they use the physical challenges to help kids overcome other challenges. And so they get together in groups after they've done it and they have discussions like this. For example, if we see a child that is spends like three, four minutes on a platform staring at a challenge and then decides to do the challenge. This is when, as part of the briefing moment, we will say, we noticed that you spent several minutes looking at that challenge. What were the thoughts that told you you could do it? And then we start from that point and then we expand And then we ask the group, where do you think you will have the same challenges and the same thoughts could help you to overcome that challenge? For example, it could be a tough homework assignment or a test or maybe a problem with a friend. And they also talk through how to change your mindset if you weren't able to complete the ropes course, how to meet the challenge. And in addition to the courses, they help kids with academics, nutrition, they have STEM and art activities, and they even introduce kids to different jobs. And now they're piloting a new program to focus on mindfulness. I love what Julia has to say about what she wants to impart to these kids of all ages. Each of them has a voice that counts and should be heard. If you want to check out Dragon's Den with your family or maybe a kids group, we have the link for you at kidsburg.org slash podcast. Pittsburgh is Kidsburg. You're listening to the Kidsburg Podcast. Dragon's Den is a place where both mental and physical challenges come together to teach kids. And that's much of what happened on the baseball field for our next guest, former Pittsburgh Pirate Travis Snyder. He's now helping both kids and parents in how they can approach athletics in a healthy way. Here's our talk with Travis. Travis spent more than 15 years working as a professional baseball player. And since his retirement in 2022, this father of three young kids has focused on helping create a healthier culture around youth sports in America. Recently, he co-founded a company called 3A Athletics, and he regularly uses his social media platform to speak about mental health and spark discussions about the ways to make the sports experience a positive force in kids' lives. Travis, thanks so much for visiting the Kidsburg Podcast. Thank you guys for having me. So first off, we would love to have you tell the kids and parents who are listening what it was like to work as a baseball player and what it was like to play here in Pittsburgh, particularly on the team that gave Pittsburgh fans that incredible 2013 season. Yeah, playing baseball was always my dream since I was a little kid. It's what I love to do outside of the other sports that I play, but baseball was my favorite. So when I got the opportunity out of high school to get drafted and then go and play professionally, it was, like I said, a dream come true. Spent six years in the Toronto Blue Jays organization, and then I got traded over to the Pittsburgh Pirates, which was an incredible experience for myself, my wife, uh, my family and friends to be able to play in the city of Pittsburgh on a team that broke the long extended streak of not making the playoffs and getting a chance to do that in 2013 uh, is something that I will remember for the rest of my life. I think a lot of Pittsburgh fans will never forget the night of the wild card game and how intense that was. I wasn't a starter that game, but standing up in the dugout and listening to all the fans, uh, the energy, it, it's something that every time I talk about it, I get chills just remembering how special the energy was in that stadium that night. And Travis, we know it's hard work to be a baseball player. And for kids who have dreams of pursuing a challenging career like professional baseball, what thoughts do you have for these kids about balancing working hard and sticking with their goals, but still having fun and not putting too much pressure on themselves? Yes, working hard is obviously the number one ingredient when it comes to being successful at anything. Uh, If you want to be great at something, it takes a lot of practice. But through our childhood years, it can become increasingly pressure-filled experience for kids to have to go out there and perform on the field in front of crowds. And I think that's something as I've looked back on my childhood experiences, I played on a lot of successful teams through Little League, through the summer club baseball experience, and then our high school baseball team, uh, which won the state championship my senior year. And I think, you know, for kids listening, understanding that, number one, if you have a dream, pursue it, but understand that there's a point in time where you can get serious, and that's much later down the road in your teenage and high school years. Uh, But if you do love something, finding a way to get out in the backyard or in the street, a safe street, obviously, or at the park or or with your parents, anytime you can get outside and play, 
uh, and play the game or play the sport that you love, that that's just continuing to get more practice, more repetitions, and that's what's going to make you great at whatever you decide you want to do. So a lot of the coverage that we do at Kidsburg talks to kids and families about education and about the ways the kids are thinking about their futures and dreaming about the things they might want to do. Now, obviously, it's uncommon to pursue a career as exciting as baseball and to succeed at the levels that you did. But in some ways, your story is even more unique because now you're pursuing a second career when you're still only in your 30s. So we wondered, how did you decide what you wanted to do after baseball? And what's it been like learning a whole bunch of new skills? I think starting with the identity, right? Uh, From my childhood and adult years, I was always known as the baseball player. And I think that's one important message I want to convey to children and to parents listening is that who you are and what you do are two completely separate things. And in our society and our culture, uh, we heavily tie our identity on our accomplishments or or what we do for a living or what we want to be when we grow up. And that's a lot of pressure. And I think for kids to understand that you're going to have lots of dreams throughout your childhood into your teenage years and even into your adult years and for me i was lucky enough to play professional baseball for 16 years but at the end of that i wasn't going to continue to play baseball into my 40s into my 50s so at at that point i had to go through a process of unpacking my identity and how closely tied that was to baseball being a baseball player and what i had accomplished in baseball and those are all things that i'm very proud of but i also had to learn and understand how that identity can make things very confusing uh, and very difficult at times to believe that you are anything other than what you do. And as you mentioned, learning new skill sets is something I I started to do throughout my career, whether it came on the sports psychology side, studying how my brain and how the people around me were functioning in a space, you know, such as professional sports. And then as I become a father and understanding the things and the lessons and the principles that I want to teach my children, but also understanding that children develop right in different stages. And I think that's one thing parents overlook at times and children are are kind of put in this position where there's too much expected from them at too young of an age. And we as parents want to provide them with the best opportunities and the best coaching and the best training for whatever it is our children are trying to pursue. But understanding there's a very delicate line, there's a balance, as you mentioned before, of of being a kid and playing something versus being a professional and wanting to do this for the rest of your life or for as long as your career span will allow you to do it. I think that is such great advice that you shared. You know, you're making me think about some of the conversations I've had with my own kids and kids in the neighborhood. And I get so caught up in asking them about, you know, a baseball game or a soccer game, right? But I need to take the time to ask them, like, what else are you interested in? What else do you like to do? You know, what are you curious Mm -hmm. about? So that the conversation isn't always about one thing. And I think that that's all I wonder and care about. Yeah, and I think one of the the most informational books I read was Mindset by Carol Dweck. And in that book, they talk about the growth mindset and the fixed mindset. And understanding that when we praise effort and the hard work that our children and that we as adults, right, that we put in to achieve something, that's what needs to be celebrated. The achievement is a byproduct of that work. And if we put everything into the achievement or or the success of a game or a season or, or whatever it may be, We overlook all that hard work, right, that the kids and the coaches and and the parents have put into that and really being able to focus and celebrate on that hard work uh, and and really separating that identity of being a good baseball player versus being somebody who works really hard to be good at something. It's so interesting that that book spoke to you that way. Last year, I interviewed a math teacher from a high school in Hampton Township, and she said her career as a teacher was kind of shaped by reading that book and realizing that she wasn't just teaching kids math. She was trying to teach them to have a growth mindset about themselves and believe that even if they were struggling with certain problems or theories or whatever, that they could do better and that they could keep on growing. That applies to life, right? Outside of sports, uh, as the teacher mentioned, it could be math. It's, It's a regular conversation we have in our household with my children is understanding that if you're not good at something, the first question I'm going to ask you is how much have you practiced, right? And most people think, well, this kid is talented or this kid is smart or this kid is good at something. And oftentimes when you look at the actual body of work that that child's put in, there's going to be things that they have been doing for an extended period of time, right, to develop those skill sets. And some kids get exposure to things earlier than others. You know, some kids have never even tried, for example, dribbling a basketball and going out and playing on a basketball team or hitting a baseball and going and playing for a baseball team. And I think we're really quick to say somebody's good at something or somebody's natural or somebody's talented without recognizing that 
all of us have capabilities, right? There are some limitations, but I, I like to believe that we can achieve most things that we put our mind to, especially if we're willing to put in the hard work and also look at those opportunities when things don't go our way. We use that term failure. Really all that is is an opportunity to learn and reflect and then be able to make adjustments if it is your goal to continue to move forward and pursue becoming better at a skill or at a sport or whatever it may be. It's the work that you're going to continue to put in the adjustments that you make along the way. That is good advice all around, for, no matter what you pursue. Uh, Travis, I want to turn to 3A Athletics. You have so many great videos there, and you've used your public platform to talk about mental health and sports in ways that are helpful for families to understand. I did not grow up playing sports, but I have two kids who are heavily involved in sports, and I found your videos really helpful. And I was hoping you could share a little bit with parents about what a healthy approach to sports parenting could be and how sports parenting is evolving, especially now that we're much more aware of the importance of mental health. Yeah, I think you hit it. Awareness is that first step, right? And that's the first A in 3A athletics is creating awareness amongst parents, coaches, and players, right? And for parents specifically, becoming more self-aware, right, of what our past experiences in sports or, or a lack thereof, right? If you never played sports, it's going to be tough for you to have that foundation of experience of having gone through it in your childhood. But with that being said, some people who go through that experience of playing sports in their childhood, they have really positive and they have negative experiences, right? And I think what I've learned about the human mind is we have the conscious mind and the subconscious mind. And, and many of us operate in this place where we think we know what our, our triggers are or what the, uh, the situations that we're encountering or the conversations that we're trying to have with our kids and, and the wisdom that we're trying to impart with them. Where is that coming from? And so that's that first layer is creating awareness. And, and then the second layer is is being able to actually go through this process with your child and have some sort of a framework, right, of how to have difficult conversations. When your child goes through something in sports, how do you handle that conversation? How do you have an intentional conversation with your child without wanting to coach and parent them in the moment, but give them a chance to use their voice and to tell you how they actually feel? And, and little things, right, such as asking your child, did you have fun? That's a harmless question in the mind of a parent is we want our kids to have fun, right? But even just asking your child, did you have fun, creates a, a layer of pressure that the child can feel consciously or subconsciously to say, wow, do I need to have fun doing this particular activity or sport for my mom or my dad to feel like they can love me or we can love each other through this process instead of really being able to just sit down with your child in a safe space and creating that, that safe conversation around the sports experience, right? So then we can go through this process with parents and parents can go through this process with their children so that they're better prepared for those conversations, whether they played sports or not. It's really about parent education, parent awareness, right? Because we are the most important relationship in our child's life. Uh, and, and then being able to work through the, the aspect of coaching and how important that role is in sports. Within this parent guidebook, we also talk about how to interact with the coaches, right? Because there are difficult situations as a parent when things aren't working out the way you had expected or your child had expected with a sport. And being able to have a healthy conversation with the coach, approach that conversation respectfully, right? Because as I've observed in youth sports, there are a lot of great coaches who are getting burnt out. There are a lot of parents who feel a, a ton of pressure to go out there and provide their children and with the best coaching and the best training. But we're overlooking, right, how important it is for us as the adults in this environment to really set the example of how we communicate, how we react, whether that's in the game, in the car, before and after the game, and just the intentional conversations we're having about sports. That's so interesting. We ran a story last year by a local parent who was talking about how the ride to the field or to the court or whatever and the ride home, because her dad had been really supportive and just just made space when she would finish, uh, I believe she was a basketball player, when she would be at the end of a game and he'd pick her up, he just gave her space to talk. And she realized with her own kids, instead of saying, well, how do you think you played? And like all the questions, she wants them to succeed. So the questions she would love to ask, but that might put pressure on her kids. She knew enough not to do that. But I think for a lot of parents, like you said, if they didn't play sports themselves, they may not know what they're supposed to do. And it's so funny, gosh, it's, you said, you know, that, that question about did you have fun? I think I always thought that would be the low pressure question I could ask. So my boys didn't feel like, how do you feel about the fact that you didn't get a hit? I'm not asking them that. I'm like, did you have a good time? But I see how, yeah, I guess even that kind of has its own pressure. 
Yeah, and I think reframing some of these questions, again, this isn't to villainize parents. I think more importantly, I, I've gone through this, right, as a parent where I'm learning constantly with three children at seven, four, and two. There's completely different developmental stages and expectations as to what your child actually understands and can handle from an emotional standpoint, a psychological standpoint. And I think that's uh, one of the most rewarding parts of this experience for me is continuing to learn as much as we want to continue to educate parents throughout this process, just the little nuances, if you can make your relationship with your child 10 or 20% better, right? Just by changing the narrative of the conversations that you have, being very aware of the energy that you're bringing into the car or into the game on the sidelines, whatever sport or activity, right? And, and this applies to school as well. I've learned this with my oldest child. You know, sometimes kids have a rough day at school and you may get a, a letter home from the teacher about a behavioral problem or, or something that happened. And our first instinct as parents, right, is to want to go and meet the problem head on. And we want to have the conversation with our child. We want to make sure they understand this is not okay. And I think what I've learned through experience of doing this the wrong way, right, and educating myself throughout this process is understanding that when you create that safe space, when you provide your child with that opportunity to come to you and share, right, that opens the door to so much more honest and impactful conversation versus the, the natural reaction for me as a parent. I want to parent my child right away. And I think that as children develop and, and as we become more aware of where they're at in kind of these developmental stages, it just gives us parents more confidence, right? And being able to enter that space and have that conversation in a much less threatening way, which in turn leads for your child to want to seek out those conversations with you because they know it's not going to be an attack. It's going to be an actual conversation where you can help them think through the process and continue to develop the skills, right? Of how to deal with those situations, whether it's at school, at sports or on the playground. That makes so much sense. Thank you so much for your time today. I'm so glad you could be on our podcast, and we will keep an eye on what's going on with 3A Athletics. Excellent. I appreciate the opportunity and the conversation. There is so much I was inspired from by listening to Travis. I especially remember when he said that your identity is more than what you do. It's really who you are. And that just really stuck with me, both for me and my kids. So I can't wait to now impart that to them, but also listen more to them when they're talking or I'm not talking in the car. <laughs> well, it's true. And I think this is valuable, whether your kids are into sports or anything else. There's There was so much good stuff here. I also appreciated how Travis shared to give kids the space to decompress afterwards and not to follow your instinct and jump in and try to solve the problem, but give them that space to think through what happened. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we have a link to Travis's website in with the parent videos, uh, which I know you guys are going to want to watch, and also the book that he referenced at kidsburg.org slash podcast. You're listening to the Kidsburg Podcast. Pittsburgh is Kidsburg. Travis shared some great ideas on how to have good conversations with your kids, especially how to listen. And we posed that question to teenagers too. We asked them, what can parents do to have better conversations with you? The students with SLB Radio Youth Media Center helped us out by asking fellow students. There's a type of way you could talk to your teen is by like, Y'all both sitting down, and you just start off. You be like, here, so this is what's about to go down. You tell them what's about to happen, and then you just tell them to speak truthfully about anything that's been going on because you know that that's your child. And as long as you're calm and your teen, she or he's calm, everything might go all right. It could be about school. It could be about starting a new phase in life, stuff you did back then, stuff you want to accomplish. I think parents could have better conversations with their kids, maybe by like being more patient and being more considerate of what the teenager is going through and trying to be and maybe in their shoes. Like mostly about like the topic should be like me instead of like school, things going on in my life and like what I'm currently doing in my life. I feel it would be easier if my parents knew what I liked and like were into what I liked. Maybe you finding ideas to do stuff 
with um like things that your child likes is a good idea. Wow, we covered a lot in this podcast. This has been so much fun. Let's do it again. <laughs> good, because we have a lot more to talk about. And we hope you'll come back for more inspiration, places to visit, and what kids are thinking. And until then, you can get so much more great info for families at kidsburg.org. And be sure to subscribe to the Kidsburg podcast so you are the first to know when the next one drops. We hope you and your kids enjoy this. This is Felix. I'm 14 years old and I live in Allegheny Commons. And this is the Kidsburg Podcast. On the next Kidsburg Podcast, we get inspiration from Sylvia Acevedo, the former CEO of Girl Scouts of America, about her role as well as her role as a rocket scientist. And she talks about how to help kids set goals. Plus, we learn about an incredible makerspace called Assemble, and we spill the tea with teens about who their role models really are. Until then, we hope you'll visit kidsburg.org for all the resources on the people, the places, and the ideas that are making Pittsburgh one of the most kid-friendly places there is. And be sure to subscribe to the free Kidsburg newsletter.